right, guys, welcome everyone to the rope dope Music and Arts Festival. I'm one of your hosts today, Fabian Brown. And, you know, as the mission continues to support artists, you know, during this, this crazy time, over the next couple of days, over the next two days, uh, the rope dope community is coming together and we're, we're going to be putting together conversations with, with rope dope cats. We're going to be doing live sets. We're going to be doing special video premieres. And um, this is a shout out to launchglobal.tv. Uh, they're the cats behind the scenes that's putting this platform together. You know, we have, you know, some serious veterans that position to to really take over the live stream to support artists and independent artists here in the industry. Um, this festival also is coinciding with Bandcamp Day, giving fans and artists a further way to connect and collaborate and support independent musicians. And over these two days, guys, I mean, I'm looking at the lineup here. It is it is pretty, pretty serious. And before I hand it over to Lewis Marks and our special guest, let me just go over some things that we're going to be watching. Uh, for today, as an example, we're going to be diving in with David Wurzel, man, revealing the story behind the iconic rope dope brand and t shirt i'm so so excited about that we have some video premieres coming up from sasha masakowski from david whitman from jason miles uh, a little bit later on we're gonna have um ali harveen coming on we have max possessin malumbo with paige hamilton and then we're gonna close out today with a dj set from the one and only dj logic coming up at six o'clock so you guys want to make sure you're hanging around for that and then i'll give you the recap of what's coming up for tomorrow's show but um i have the honor and i have the privilege privilege of introducing Mr. Lewis Marks, who's been at the helm of rope dope for over a decade, you know, propelling and pushing this brand forward. Uh, Lewis, can you hear me okay? I'm here. Can you hear me? I got gotcha. you. All right. It's good to be here uh, virtually uh, from a remote location, but I missed the rope dope room. This is my fake rope dope room here at home. <laughs> Baby and Brown, thank you. Uh, my, my, our first guest gets that fake reference. Uh, and I want to talk about this cat. Um, gosh, it's about 20 years ago, somebody walked into my office and said, I have this clothing brand and it's also a record label and we want to do a new thing called web stores and we want somebody to print, I need somebody to print t-shirts, I need somebody to do labels, I need somebody to do this, to do that. And I just looked and said, okay, We'll do that. And that's how I started <laughs> at, at, at rope, with rope uh, You know, it's 2020, and it, there's not a day that goes by that I don't look back at the rope clothing line. Uh, and I pull those designs out, and they're just as fresh as they were the day they were printed. And there's been a lot of, a lot of work going on at rope around music, and I do regret that we don't do as much with clothing anymore. But... This cat, David Wurzel, uh, his eye, his attention to detail, his m meticulous uh, attention to detail <laughs> when we were working together was amazing. But he also, <laughs> and you know, I was talking to Logic the other day. He said, you know, David always built a story. So you can't really look at Rope Dope as a brand musically or in apparel without that input, that beginning input of you have to tell a story. And what's amazing is the stories are about things that are so relevant and so poignant today. Um, icons, the Mexico City imagery, the American Immigrant Collection, the City Series, the Worldwide Respect Series, it goes on and on. All of this come from David Wurzel. But the last thing I wanna say, there's plenty more to his life. He's intertwined business, and social good consistently, both at Rope It Up with the clothing line, but further in the first 20, uh, which helped uh, firefighters with fitness issues. Uh, and now his new project we're gonna talk about today is the road to resilience. And I have as many questions as you do. So David Wurzel, <laughs> AKA Words, it's good to see you brother. It's been a while. And the good, yeah, wow. Good to see you. I want to. I want to keep going. That in. I mean, you were bringing me back and all this stuff. And first of all, thank you. Uh, I, I want you to have you do all my introductions going forward wherever I go. Uh, you kind of forget about what you do. Uh, for me, it was uh, when we, you know, truth be told, Lewis and I interfaced about a couple weeks ago because I'm actually starting to write a book. 
And everybody's like, oh, you know, you got to have a book these days. So I started going backwards to go forwards and really looking at some of these areas of my life. And Rope It Ope is really, for me, is that that inflection point um, where all these things came together. And the only thing I will correct is I might have had the idea, and Fabian and I were just discussing this before you got on, where, hey, like, maybe we do this thing. But it was it was a sheer collective in what made this function. And I think that's what makes it so vital today is, it wasn't, yeah, maybe I have an idea. And Lewis Marks was like, oh, that's your idea. Like, you're going to go toilet paper Fabian's house. But why don't you go over through the backyard? I'm like, oh, my God, that's a great idea. I never thought about that. So everybody layered on ideas that, and sometimes, like, made the whole thing change. So there's a, you know, there's a, the idea of a journey. Like, you don't know what you're going to find on the journey. Uh, you know, you're going to do with what you're going to find. But ultimately, for me and Rope Dope, I didn't know what Rope Dope was going to do to me. So I was fundamentally changed by the Lewis Marxes, the DJ Logics, the Andrew Cunninghams, and all these folks that were endemic in making the brand come to life. So thanks for letting me come out here and like kind of tell some tell some of that story. Yeah, it's great. I mean, we do we do put uh, on the website like we kind of follow Robot of wherever it may lead, and it, and it is about collaboration yeah. for Andrew and Nate Silver and all the other cats. But yeah, uh, Nate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we kind of touched on how it started, but let, let's go back to the beginning. Why a clothing line in the first place? How, how, did, how did that begin? Well, you know, I, I always start with long ago, I discovered like how people define themselves is the, the music they listen to, the clothes they wear, and the communities they live in. And I, that holds true no matter where I go. And I remember talking and working in the military. I was in a bunch of guys working in the Air Force. I'm like, oh, that's a bunch of, that's silly. I'm like, wait. You all, you all went to some country music show last night. They're like, oh, yeah, we saw whoever it was. I'm, you all look the same, and you're all hanging out together. You're all dressed the same. Like They're like, wait a minute. There's something to that. So you start with this idea that this is how we express ourselves. And, I, and if I go back to it, probably somewhere in the early 90s, what started to happen was these ideas existed. Well, this is part of how we do it. From a branded perspective, it wasn't – there was – none of those were housed under one roof. And – um, I think it was like, uh, I think it was Tommy Helfinger went from being this brand that like all these preppy white dudes wore to like this urban street brand. Mm -hmm. And what happened, I think it was, again, I'm going to go back early nineties and Fabian, somebody's got to, somebody fact check me on this stuff is it fact was like, is over. We don't do that. No, yeah, right. I know. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. Just not even please. Um, so it was, um, I think, Raekwon from Wu-Tang. I think uh, the Brand Nubians. Who is that guy, Brand Nubians? Uh, Grand Poobah. Grand Poobah, the founder of the Brand Nubians. They started wearing um, Tommy Hilfinger. So Hilfinger was like solid. And actually, Pooba, this is, now it's coming back. So Mary J. Blige dropped her record. It's called What's the 411? That's her, seven, that's her first record that came out 93, 92. Puba put a line on it about wearing wearing uh, Hilfinger. So boom, this brand like exploded, and it went from like he saw it on the rack at Marshalls to like now it was like the, like a coolest, freshest thing going. But it was all fake and phony. There wasn't real behind it. And at the time, through happenstance, I was helping a friend of mine as a photographer who was taking some pictures, and I'm like, you put them on shirts, and happened to have a band. I was like, yeah, it's like music and clothes, kinda. But along came Rope It Up. So when the music came out and Rope It Up industry, Rope It Up music broke, and Andy, you know, and those guys had the idea for, like, really, a, you know, what what still today is this groundbreaking label that's going to push the the envelope in all different directions. It's like the Duke Ellington. There's only two kinds of music: good music and bad music, right? Rope It Up is like that's it. So we wanted to it was like, wow, this would be the perfect spot to have a reflection of that in the clothing that push those boundaries, all that express like how we all live, that express that in a different way. Right. So that was really the inception point for Rope Dope, that idea of real music, real clothes, real ideas. So you started at some point to kind of group those, you know, to, to make a collection. And yes. you picked certain images. I mean, did, did, you have, did you have the concept first of like, I'm gonna do a line of the the icons of music nina simone john lee hooker or 
did, did that happen? Did the collection happen after you picked certain things? Like, how did you get to that concept of like classics? Well, I kind of like, well, this one I think is really why Rope Dope is so successful. It's an organic path. That, like, where do I, what do I travel around? Like, like what influences me? I'm always like, what books, what music? And what I realized is I draw my influences from sports, from politics, from music. And I think for most of us, we have these things, these, these, these ideas that define us. But like music, there's nobody's listening to just one genre of music anymore. Everyone listens to so much. So, you know, and again, on the clothing, it was, hey, who influences us? And then that process was like putting it out there to in the collective and everybody's like, I was, hey, how about Gandhi? It was like, Gandhi, dude, you gotta do King Tubby. I'm like, oh my God, King Tubby. So then it became this, everyone had their people, all the designers and we all came together and that's how that started was we all came to team with like, okay, are we, is somebody not represented at the table? Are we missing some segment of society? I'm, dude, Pele, I'm like, Pele. You know, we gotta get Pele into the mix. So that's how that really, that's how that it, manifests. It's interesting because in retrospect, what was happening in the internet at, the, at that time or, or has happened since is that people have forgotten who the, who the heroes are. Yeah. Like you're putting these people up, you're, you're kind of preserving history in a fashion sense at a time when people are just getting lost in a, in a sea of information. You know, and you fast forward 10 years and people are like, you know, saying that Paul McCartney owes Kanye a debt for breaking him. You know what I mean? It's like that's how <laughs> right. Right. people got, you know? Um, yeah. So, so you got your icons, then you move on to social issues. Like, So we move on to, I think the big deal in Rope It Up was, um, it's not what you look at, it's what you see. You know, I think Bob Marley kind of expressed it. He said, you know, some people dance in the rain, some people just get wet. Uh, so how are you going to experience the world around you? Do I see Lewis as a, a white guy? Or do I see, you know, this person as a female or old, young? It's like we smash into each other's pieces of each other. We think we only see pieces. And the idea was, how do we go just beneath the surface for the real story here? Like, how do we start seeing the world around us and pulling in images and other things that allow us to see it all differently and maybe in a more authentic way. And that's okay, right? I always feel like it's okay to see the bumps and the bruises and the imperfections, because I was like that perfectionist guy, but that's who we are. And so I think that's where we ended up going was, you know, as we kind of got into these social issues is like, what's this thing called America? That's, you know, America is a potentiality. It's not an actuality. We're always kind of getting there and who makes America work? How's it work? And where does it fall short? You know? So my my favorite image on the American immigrants here is maybe you know, jump jumping ahead too far, but no, go ahead. was the Statue of Liberty like panhandling. You know, oh, that yeah. one where that that one was like I think my favorite because it's this idea we want to see America as right. There it is. There it is. I want that one back. I uh so I got out of grief wearing that. Like, whoa, man, how could you see it that way? How do you but see America thing, that way? This is the perfect example. If somebody looks at that shirt today, they're not going to ask you that question. Right. You know, right. you are 15 yeah. years ahead of what's happening because you're seeing the disconnect in American culture and the problems. And now people are waking up and going, oh, wow. Right. I thought right. this was the shiny city on a hill. No, there's the Statue of Liberty is actually homeless and panhandling at this point. Homeless and pan. Yeah. So it's that. Yeah. And it's really interesting. So what is the American dream? What's the gap between where we are to that space? Yeah. Uh, I think it was somebody like Kierkegaard said, I judge a, a society by the by the uh, problems they're trying to solve. Um, so I'm, I'm like, where I'm a little hopeful is like, we're trying to solve, how do we get rid of Donald Trump? I'm sorry, I'm putting it out there that way is, but we're solving, we're looking at issues that I think it's not what makes us bad. It's like, we're trying to make, how, how does everyone rise in the society? And where are these inequities at? And maybe it's time to see it differently. You know, the Howard's in the the wrong people are in jail and the wrong people are out of jail. The wrong people are in power and the wrong people are out of power. How do we turn that around? I think that's an ongoing question. We were trying to, we were at least asking, I think the right questions or digging in the right area back when we were coming up with those those clothes. 
100%. 100%. I, I'm curious, and I, I don't think I've ever really kind of asked you this personally, but now that, you know, we're, we're all a little older um, and I have some, some, some retrospect, like, how did you personally come to this? Because it speaks to what you're doing now. I want to talk about that next, but you strike me. It's it's interesting. I didn't notice this commonality between us, but you 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 speak and you talk about concepts as if you were uh, a seasoned intellectual, <laughs> and yet you're hanging down at the fire department, right? With it with, right. with with the union guys or or at the military, right? right. So how do you, how do right. you you bridge those worlds? How did you come to that? How like, uh, it just happened to you? Yeah. yeah, you know, it's funny. It's the Lewis Marx has happened to me. So it's, it's so it's listening to someone else's story. When you, you know, maybe taking this step into like what I discovered in our work is you know, how our brain designed to work and what and what's going on. So we have experiences happen around us that we don't control and our subconscious is making um, value assessments all the time that might not be in our best interest based on so you know what what we don't realize is we see ourselves as separate but we're not and what happens is so when we're born you know a young child their brain develops like in the mom they, they don't see themselves different as the mother our brains are not designed to be separate we're highly socialized brains our brains exist within other brains if they're in a set uh there's a concept of neurobiology it's neurons neighborhoods it's the same there's a social synapse that happens between us but what's going on is um I'm taking in information growing. I'm taking in the narratives around me to just to, and eventually that imprints on me, like this is who I am, but it's really not. It's who everyone else around me is or some narrative that I've been given. And I don't know if that's my narrative. So mm -hmm. realizing that everyone else is not, they're just subject to like where they're born and who raised them. Um, and so I think once you can kind of, for me, once I started, I worked as a ranch hand and these guys, when I was out in Colorado, and these guys had all their Wranglers on their stuff, and I was like, oh my God, I got nothing coming with these guys. And one night we went out for a beer, and, and this guy and I, Steve Lucky, started having this conversation. I was like, holy shit, we see things exactly the same. And my mind was blown, because we look different. So mm -hmm. you got to get beneath the veneer of how we're designed to see each other. My, my mind was blown. We just look to see different. race so and gender. We need to get rid of it. So. I kind of had that realization in maybe in a more experiential way. Mm. So I was like, wow, what's that person's story? And once you get in the story, you're like, holy shit, like Lewis is the guy who grew up in Camden. He was the only white guy in Camden, you know? And I'm still, I remember parts of our stories and how you told me, I'm like, I would never picture Lewis kind of coming from this space to Lewis. So, you know, what you don't know about someone could just about fill the Grand Canyon. And it's, so I learned earlier on just to start asking people about their stories and really tripping out on what, what what was going on there fascinating and a great model for people no doubt we i, I you know i don't want to leave out the monolithic press so i was like wow what's that person's story and once you get into the story like holy shit like that is in front of us every day that leads people yeah. to uh sort of a one or two dimensional idea of who they are democratic yeah event or you know so no, it is, and it's 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 a shame. Really, it really is a shame. Where everybody's so rich and vital, and when you understand um, where, when you understand how that works, and I think the term you were talking about, there's so much information. It's this infobesity, and we tend to put our brains because our brains are harassed and they're troubled because this realness is in us and it's suppressed by this crap that comes in on us all the time. So. When you start asking the question, like, why do I need to hate you? I'm not quite sure I get this. Why do I need to hate the guy that doesn't agree with me? Because they don't agree with you. You know, Gore Vidal said, it's not that we should be right. Or, I'm right. It's that you need to be wrong. That's the problem here. Right? So um, Ruby Sales is a lesser known civil rights activist. And she said something to me that flipped the script. Absolutely. Which was... Um, we needed, she said we needed a redemptive theology. But what, what we do for the road to resilience is we want to give you a redemptive ideology. Where can I grow? Where can I plant myself and be refreshed? What ideas can I put in me that will refresh me and help me rejuvenate? Um, so these people who are these white supremacists in these areas of this country, I'm going to go to the extreme, <laughs> as their whiteness has been taken away from them because now we have more rights, 
you know, those rights are kind of shifting out and as they get less rights and now there's more people of color with more opportunities to those people and they're moving up and ascending and hopefully supposedly in certain areas of our nation, they're diminished. Where are they going to refresh themselves? There is nothing. There's no redemptive ideology for them. Wow. The only person feeding them is Donald Trump who feeds them hate and anger and he fills them, right? I should hate you or I should be fearful of you. And, that, and that's where our brain naturally goes. So that's why he succeeds. Um, so anyway, so that's, wow. you know, what we need to counterbalance what's coming in and, and start feeding out something more positive, more positive narratives here. Beautiful. So you mentioned the road to resilience. I, I didn't know if you wanted to, uh, I, the first 20 always fascinated me. I don't know if you want to talk, talk about that real quick. Well, it, yeah. So really the road to resilience is just a program from the first 20. They're, they're just still, they're still the first 20. So, um, I started the first 20. So I was, I've been a firefighter for the better part of over two decades. I just retired. I'm 53. I retired like a couple of years ago. Um, and when I was working within the fire service, these folks had a lot of problems, neck up and neck down. And they were just like this subset of America. And I was like, you know what? Um, that sucks. These folks, and I was working as a volunteer and these folks who give so much are, are like suffering. There's no programs. So I was like, I don't know. Let me see if I can step in and fix this or help. And I think really in retrospect, I was trying to fix myself. Like mm -hmm. I have all these broken jangly pieces that don't go together. And how do I fix myself and make sense of what's going on inside of me? So I, I do think there was something in it, but the, the term comes from the idea that, you know, the first 20 minutes of a fire is the most important. It determines like, uh, it's super chaotic. You can see it's, it's super hot. You have tons of gear on. So, Originally, we were like, how do we help somebody succeed in that first 20 minutes? And then it kind of manifested to you know, a lot greater, which is now about how do we help you succeed in life? What kind of mindset that I can give you that'll drive you to make changes neck up and neck down? And and it's been a, you know, a, for me over a decade march to or search for that spot where I can plant that flag and say, this is the fertile ground to change right here. And that's where we're at. Where we landed with the road to resilience is hopefully we're digging in that space. So uh, what can people expect? And, or do you want to walk through like the steps of the road to resilience or? Sure. Well, it's really simple. Yeah. I mean, like it's, uh, the idea is everything's a journey. Like you're never there. <laughs> it sounds super cliche. Life's about the journey, but it is, but it's, what am I going to, what, where could I go to fill myself? Where, where is that redemptive ideology found? And for us, it's, we dig into the idea of the spirit. So our spirituality is defined by our, or is what leads us to greater meaning and purpose. And where we go for that meaning purpose is community. So that's our natural flow point is to be, is to be in community. So it has no, it's not rooted in a, in a theology, but I don't care what church or synagogue or mosque you're in if you're real about it, when you step out that door, that's where it becomes real. So we talk about bringing that spirituality into the day to day. I don't need, I need spirituality in the, the synagogues or the mosque or the yoga studio or my ashram. I need it in Walmart, <laughs> you know, and that's, a, that's the last place you expect it to be. So we call this place the spiritual frontier where like the spirit meets the day to day. Um, and making it real. So it's a very simple process that we bring and it's about humanizing other people and seeing like, hey, Lewis, I see you. Um, recognizing other people and the humanity in other people. And it could be, a, hey, wave to someone, how are you? Understanding that the simplest way is so, we have a very specific pattern we teach. We, so when I work with first responders and military and police officers, it's we teach them this methodology, compassion, gratitude and faith so i i show you we live in this state of continuous community to make it real i have to show you i care about you you start that flow lewis goes oh wow Dave, that's really nice Dave. you reflect in gratitude and then when i'm like hey there's this unknown thing going on you're like hey dave i got your back so through faith we step into the unknown together so life's about this we need to be together and that's how we move forward is together we you know we all rise together so that's the road to resilience in a nutshell we ramp it up and programatize it but it's just about kindness and caring and humanization so help me out where, where 
pe people come to you individually or are you building this program to be implemented in different settings? Yeah, uh, more the latter. So basically we took some big, we had some big swings. So I work with the Air Force. I developed their program for the Air Force Fire Service. I, uh, I work with the US Fire Service, the city of Baltimore, police and fire. Any fans of the wire, who, I know you're out there. I work with, with uh, Baltimore police and they were driving me around to like, I'm in the Western, you know, where's Bunny Colvin? So anyway, I got to work in Baltimore, city of Detroit uh, and Philly. So we want to make sure it worked and now we're migrating out to everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we just got, we, I mean, after we just got a, a big grant from FEMA and we're gonna like right now, uh, the city of El Paso called me, which is not, kind of funny. Can you come down here and work with our citizens? I'm like, absolutely. Wow. So, so the idea is how do which we build that? Back to the American immigrant. Right? Cause it's like, that, make that this what's here? that's exactly what's happened here. My favorite thing to say is mucho gusto. Oh, mucho gusto. I love to meet you. Great to meet you too. Um, so we're making the program bilingual and the city of Juarez in Mexico, because they're sister cities, is like, hey, can you come here? I'm like, this is this is insane. That's uh, so to be able to work with the Latinx population sp specifically, because they're also beset with a lot of physical and um, mental disease. Uh, so it's really so our program links into fitness and wellness ideas that, that kind of help you out and make you better in those areas of so health safety and performance so we're moving into that population so uh, hopefully we want to get this going in philadelphia as well but right now i'm just they call them I was like yep i'll go down there so yeah, yeah. that's amazing that's it's full, full circle so, it really has yeah, well right. this is yeah this is full circle for me Lowe's. i tell you what like even just hearing your your, your conversation in the beginning looking at the lineup um you know because i, I kind of want to reflect back a little bit yeah. uh that you know i was thinking about how things endure i'm like you've been around fabian introduced you you've been the guy pushing this thing you know a lot of times uphill and is missing a couple tires you know you're like no problem i got it all the time uphill, bro. <laughs> all the time uphill. All the time. Yeah. Even when there we were was, together, there was, it was uphill. There was a point around Snarky Puppy's <laughs> Grammy where just I could see the, over the hill yeah. for a minute. And you know what was on the other side of it? Another there fucking hill. <laughs> there was another uh, called Streaming. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, people people don't understand it's like the making sausage and, and how things work and, and seeing it. But I mean, I give you a lot of credit. And I think what's so special for me is to create something that that hopefully is real but when you pass the mantle like what's the next person going to do and to see it grow and blossom in other ways so we created a space where people can come and express themselves and now maybe culture those expressions are a little different uh the music sonically might sound but it's still the same thing yeah. um I, I liken it to the rope it's like the constitution it's the true we the people spot where we constantly go and refresh ourselves like our spirituality can be greatly enhanced through the music we listen to all the time um and you know i still have uh well, i don't know where it's around here but i i still have the um uh the campbell brothers i listen to can you feel it like that's my mandate yeah yeah so uh dj logic you know the anomaly comes on top to bottom my, my kid loves it you know talk about being fresh we're at like so, 600 records now that's insane. So, yeah. well, that's what I'm saying for me is like to get back to what the day's about is giving back to these people who really at the end of the day, whatever they're playing, like people, that's important for people. That's helping people. Anger and fear keep me rooted in my meat sack. I needed to rise above this thing, <laughs> you know, and that and music is what's going to take me here and, and let me catch sight of these ideas um, and, you know, and free myself of these malevolent forces that keep me trapped here and that press me in. So I give you guys all the credit in the world. You're doing, you are doing God's work. It is fascinating the parallels and, and the things that you're saying. I mean, I I don't remember exactly when it was, and you know, I'll say it, I'll say it live on air. It was kind of like a hippie moment at the top of the mountain. I was just like, there's clouds and they look exactly like the ocean. <laughs> right, connection makes everything work. Right. right. So now right. instead of putting out records, let's connect the artists together. 
And it's right. really fascinating. I mean, we have we have monthly gatherings. Um, we've had some things in this pandemic where people were like holed up in their house, negative on the whole world. They came to one of the Zoom meetings and saw the other artists, and everybody's in the same boat. And they were like, "Oh, okay, man. I'm, you know, I'm going to get back up. And this is this is great." We've had we had a great meeting um, around uh, on Juneteenth. You know, mm. spirit of Rome mm. where we just. I don't know, maybe there were 30, 40 people, Fabian. And basically, we didn't even have to say it, but all the white folks just muted their mics. Yeah. And all these cats told their stories of when they got wow. older. And it was really fascinating to me because I thought that musicians hanging out together would have shared those stories right. and would be seeing what's underneath more than the average guy on the street. But they hadn't heard a lot of the stories about being pulled over and being pulled out and a gun to the head and stuff like that. It was really cathartic and healing for the people just to be able to say them, you know? Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. Well, and, and to that point is when you get together, you didn't solve anyone's problem. You can get rid of COVID. Yeah. You know, you didn't, you didn't just all of a sudden call edit and everybody's pockets filled with money. Like nobody's problems were solved that day, but everyone's spirits were lifted, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And the idea to tell your story, make sure your story is heard, and somebody gets that, that's really a big deal. All we have at the end of the day is our stories. Um, and we need other people to make sense of them, uh, you know, in a kind of way. Like, so I think that's super cool that you're providing that. And especially when you get to an artist, like these are people who are expressive and I think they need, they need it even more. You know, you they, need the communication, they've been cut off. I noticed that early in the pandemic that it was, it was hurtful to the artist to not have an audience. Yeah, I really thought about that. I mean, I I knew financially you, you got to sell tickets to pay the bills, but it was like no, no, no. I I need that energy. I need to see people responding to the music, not right. just to make the music. And so right. it's not isolated. We're isolated, but that's not, you know, our whole lives, right? And so no, I think but, I think we're we're making some progress and it's coming back. Um, I was gonna. I hope so. I hope so. But I got to tell you, what, what, do I, I, I don't know what, where our time is. Do I have time for a quick story? We do, yeah. We've got, uh, we've got seven to eight minutes, I think. Is that right, so my, 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 Yeah, the quick story on my, my one of my favorite Rope Dip stories is, um, and it's kind of funny in another way. So we got calls. Um, I get emails, and there's this radio station in Philly called The Word, W-U-R-D. It's an all-black format, and they email me about, yo, we sold the shirts. This is super cool. The stand strong vibe. We're all about it. Uh, and I started, started emailing them. So um, my email is words at Robo. We're going back and forth. And these folks thought I was black. So it was really funny. I walked down to the, go down to the studio. And um, it's a big glass door. So I remember, you know, I'm like, knock on the door. And there's these two dudes sitting at the table. And they look over at me. And they all go back to start talking again. They just don't even get up, right? Like this guy, this white guy's in the wrong spot. So, you know, I'm like, okay, like knock, knock, knock. And, they want me, and I see them have a conversation like, okay, you got to go answer. One guy shuffles over, he's like, yo, can I help you? I'm like, yeah, man, it's words from Rope Rope. And he goes, oh, oh, hey, what's up, words? Oh, comes in and we bro up and he, he, he introduced me to everybody around the table. So we go into the, we're going to do a live on air conversation. And I'm on after Islam Today. So the guy from Islam Today is done. He's got his kufi on. He's done. He's kind of, we're in the studio. We're, I'm like, hey, we off air? They're like, yeah. I'm like, can we be real for a second? They're like, yeah, sure. What's up? I'm like, you guys thought I was black, didn't you? And they're like, we totally thought you were black. We don't know any white guy named words. You know? So we all start laughing. I'm like, the funny thing is, I'm also Muslim. I converted when I married my wife. And, you know, I'm like, Bismillah, Bahan, awesome. The guy was like, what? The guy, Islam Today guy was like, what? So we started having this inc this impromptu conversation. We go on the air and for the next hour, people were calling in about how we see each other and mm -hmm. seeing each other different. So it was really, again, we didn't solve any problems, but we opened this dialogue. And I, and again, you know, Fabe and I were talking earlier before we started like, hey, how people still spot his shirt and they have a conversation. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's partly the clothes, but it's also what we're bringing as ourselves or the energy we're bringing into this spot, what Lewis is bringing, what Fabian is bringing, what everybody's bringing into this spot. But 
we had this conversation about how to see each other different. And I always go back to that in my head. People are calling in from West Philly, North Philly. These weren't people from the suburbs. These are people with real problems that I didn't understand. And we were having this really cool conversation about how do we make it different? You know, again, that's 20 years ago. Still the same problems, but I was really hopeful. If I go back to that, it was just such a positive moment where we all dropped who we were for a second and that we were all just people. And that's rope it up. You know, we just get this safe spot to have these conversations. Well, I, you know, it's, it's great to talk to you today about these things and hear your positive energy about it, because honestly, you know, with COVID um, and with the socio-political scene and with social media complicating things, with people kind of jumping on and being aggravated in the comments and saying things that aren't true in order to just manipulate your right. mood, like people yeah. are doing that to see if they could just plant the seeds of discontent across the internet. I really have become kind of locked, locked up, you know, yeah. like I see, I see no mask. I see a pickup truck. I see a flag. That's not a traditional American flag. I'm not going to even say the name of it. And I am, I'm just, it's like uh, transformers, like boom, 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 three levels of armor. Just <laughs> close up around me. I was thinking about it the other day. I think it's like sort of like it's like a social obligation as a human that when you see another human, you should put put your best smile. It's a Buddhist thing. Like it's a lotus flower. A smile is a lotus flower. Like you're giving a gift to somebody when you smile at them. I've stopped doing that. And I need I need to I need to come back around and recognize the humanity of this. You know? It's I mean, hard, man. It's, it's really it's it's hard and it's uh yeah, you know, we can get there, but we do it together. And it's and then there's little baby steps and starting conversations about where we agree and where we're together versus not. But you know, I'm going to start where I, I kind of and where I started, which is it's the music. You know, mm -hmm. that's where we got into music. It's like how we define ourselves, and I think that plays such an important role. That's I mean, a lot of times overlooked, and how a great concert can bring people together it becomes a. I hear people talk about life changing moments. They're always around music. <laughs> In my day, like it's always around music. It used to be around a dead show. Um, right. but, uh, but the, oh my life. God, yeah. you know, sometimes the lights all shine on me. Sometimes I can barely see. So, you know, I'm going pop on the Grateful Dead here for a second, but my point Great is fun. it's, it, it's, well, yeah, it's these ups and downs, but we're going to get out the other side because of us. And remember like there's 3 million more people who voted in the last election that were on the right side of things. And there was a whole lot of people who didn't vote. So we're going to we're going to turn it around and but you can replace you can get rid of Jim Crow laws but you can't get rid of Jim Crow thinking until we start moving into these spaces these spiritual frontiers with a redemptive ideology so you know forget about us just for everybody just a little dose of kindness a hello understanding we're all suffering and the stories and these folks who fly those stupid flags and have these hateful thoughts that's not who they are that is not who they are. If they were bleeding profusely, you'd see the damage to them. But the damage comes in other ways to their psyche by getting misinformation. I constantly tell my kids, nobody ever grow up saying they want to be an asshole. No one ever said that, you know, except maybe the president. Um, but uh, no. So for understanding that most people, that's what's going on. They had some misinformation or it took them to this spot. We got to find that compassion to disengage and just help humanize people we see. So. I hear you. I'm Dave Wurtz and I prove this message. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And we, you know, and stop being shocked and outraged and and and, and process and understand. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, Lewis. Really, thank you. Is there any call to action for people who are watching? Any anywhere you want people to go? Um, yeah, I want you to go home and give somebody a hug. Go out today and everybody say hi. Really, I don't. It's not about us. I want you to go out and say hi to one more person. You didn't say okay. Five different people you see that you wouldn't say hi to. Go. You know what? I'm going to say hi to this person. That's what you should do. That's what I want everyone to do on this call after they get off, after seven o'clock tonight. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right, David. Great to chat with you. Thank you, you too, so Lewis. much. Appreciate you. All right, love you guys. Love you, Lewis. Thanks, brother. So we are still here. I assume we're still live. Where this is new for us, we're working with Mark Global, and I think we're like a minute or two. We're live, live.
Give an echo on that. So, Mr. Brown, there's a little surprise coming from Dusky. I love it. Before before we get into that surprise, uh, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. We're watching the Rope and Dope Music and Arts Festival here. This is a two-day series. We're watching day day one. We just heard from, I mean, listen, an amazing, amazing backdrop and story uh, from David Wurzel, uh, the, the, the creator and founder of uh, the Rope and Dope Apparel line. And I just want to encourage everyone, like David had mentioned, go out and, uh, you know, introduce yourself to somebody that you may not normally have introduced yourself to. Um, Louis, just to kind of touch on that, first of all, thanks for getting him in the room. That, that was literally so much more than I thought it was going to be to hear his... Um, experiences and what really goes into a, a clothing brand the ideology you know I, I can listen to him talk for another yeah this wasn't happened. just commerce right oh my goodness yeah you, you had no idea but yeah I, I want to announce a couple quick things John, not to interrupt you but i just want to Please. point out um that we're, we're coming up and you know we don't have a lot of time there's a lot of a lot of uh, material coming up here with uh performances from different people but Tomorrow, starting tonight, uh, 3 a.m. Uh, East Coast time, midnight Pacific time, it begins the next Bandcamp day. And if you're not familiar, uh, Bandcamp has been waiving their fees with artists. Uh, and we, as a label, have done extremely well, uh, and therefore the artists uh, with whom uh, we share all the revenue uh, have done well in the last two quarters through these Bandcamp days. In fact, we just got numbers in that in the last month, it's almost half of the label's entire revenue. So I want to urge people wow. to go to Bandcamp uh, uh, overnight. Uh, we'll have some special things that are going to be announced. Um, you're going to see things pop up. Pay attention to ropeadope.bandcamp.com. Dusky from Wales will have a uh, surprise EP. Uh, we'll also have some new vinyl pre-orders from Johanna Bernhardt and a special early uh, opening of one of her tracks. She's performing tomorrow, I believe. Uh, wonderful stuff. Uh, and then look for the little surprises. And because we, we got some things that I just can't say yet. Love it. Well, coming up next, uh, we have a, uh, a special a special video from Sasha Masakowski with her song entitled Entropy. And you can support Sasha at sasha-masakowski.bandcamp.com. So I'm going to head it back over to the guys over at launch uh, to queue up that video. Love Sasha. Thank you. 
We're out. Hey, coming to you from live. Uh, no, I'm not actually live. I'm pre-recording this, so there you go. But uh, but we're almost live. And um, here in my studio, I'm Jason Miles, and I'm a keyboardist, producer, arranger, composer, and worked with many great people over my career, from Miles Davis to Luther Vandross to Sting. And I'm um, happy to come and do a little music for you. Here's my new CD on rope dope called Black Magic. It's very cool, half live, half in the studio with an awesome band. And since I can't go out and perform it live, I'm going to play the title tune for you, Black Magic, with the trio. And I have it on my Pro Tool system, so I was able to kind of make it so it sounds pretty cool, I think, man. So I think you're going to like it, and I'm going to play for you Black Magic. <laughs>
All right. I just missed the ending by a little tad. I hope you'll forgive me. You'll forgive me. I know. So I'm going to do a solo piece right now. You know, I've been through some extraordinary situations in my life. I mean, in this musical world, it's been amazing. Some of the things I still can't believe happened. And working with so many wonderful people over these past 46 years, as you know, I'm just always inspired to maybe let the audience in a little bit, tell you a little story about some of the experiences I had. And one of them goes back to 1991 when I was working at the power station with Marcus Miller, who I worked with a bunch, and uh, Shaka Khan doing her new record at the time. And so we're in the studio and all of a sudden the phone rings, it's Friday night, and it rings and somebody goes, well, oh man, it's Miles Davis on the phone. And we go, yeah, Miles, man, cool. So he goes, yeah, he wants to talk to Jason. And everybody's like, wow, <laughs> you know, and Marcus is like, I can't believe I turned these guys on to each other and now they're friends, you know. So Miles wants me to come over to his house to listen to a new uh, cassette that he got from a writer. And I said, great, I'll, I'll come over. So a couple hours later, around midnight, I was walking over to his new place on Central Park uh, West. And um, he played me this uh, cassette tape. And I knew who it was immediately. It was Yvonne Linz, the great Brazilian composer. And Yvonne sent Miles these songs. Uh, I think Quincy Jones was trying to put together this project that he told me about, Miles told me about. And he said, I want you to be a part of this, man. It's going to be great, but I love this guy, you know. So I said, I, I think it's wonderful, man. And then Miles died, and nothing happened. And, um, you know, I was sitting there, and I said, you know, there's something here, man. These songs are too great. Something's got to happen with these songs. It's just too great. And I called up Yvonne, and I told him how much Miles really loved the music and everything. And, you know, let's try to do something with this. And he agreed with me. So now for eight years, I went and I struggled, man, and played this project and gave ideas and gave, you know, sheets and spreadsheets and everything to all these labels. Everybody turned it down. Some people turned it down three times. They just didn't want to hear it anymore because they didn't believe in it. And I always said, you know, we're going to get great artists to sing Yvonne's songs. That's what it's going to be. So finally, I found an opening because I made a great record for Telar called Celebrating the Musical Weather Report and had amazing artists on it and everything. And they asked me if I wanted to do anything. And I told them about the Yvonne project. And at first they were kind of kind of standoffish, but then they said, if you bring some great artists, we'll give you the deal. So I said, okay. So I went home, looked at my Rolodex, man, and I called up Sting, and I called up Shaka, and I called up uh, uh, Vanessa Williams, and Grover Washington Jr., and Diane Reeves, and uh, Freddie Cole, who was on Telark at the time, and everybody was totally into it. So I called up the label and I told them, and they didn't believe me. And I believe it or not, they looked at a lot of crap every day, prove it to us. So I said, if I prove this to you and I get you letters of confirmation, you're going to send me money like the next day. And the president of the label, Bob, who had said, uh, all right, we'll do that. And I said, okay. And I went and I spent time over the next 10 days and I got all the letters of confirmation that they want to do this. And uh, I said, okay, man, what are you going to do? I'm going to send you the money. <laughs> so he sent me the money and we ended up making the album with all these wonderful musicians and artists. It's one of my finest moments. And then a few months later, I get a phone call from a friend in California who says, in the next 10 minutes, they're releasing the Grammy uh, nominations, and you got two of them. And I went, what? What was going on? He goes, for Yvonne Lynn's uh, Best Male Pop Vocal with Sting and Best Pop Instrumental with Grover. And Grover had passed away already a month before that. And so we, we went to the Grammys, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and it says Best Male Pop Vocal, and they read Don Henley, uh, uh, Mark Anthony, Brian McKnight, and... Um, with somebody else, I think Elton John, and uh, Sting, and the winner is Sting, and man, that made that eight years totally worth it, that's all I could say, so what I'm going to do right now, is I'm going to play you the song that won the Grammy for us, and it's called She Walks This Earth, written by Yvonne, and lyrics by the great Brenda Russell, and I'm going to do it, I'm not the most amazing singer, but I'm going to give it my best shot, and I'm going to, uh, you know, next time Sting will come, okay, how's that sound? All right.
But there's nothing like them calling your name out when you hear, you know, when you hear your project won the Grammy. I mean, it was a, a pretty heady moment. So, I have a new single out on Rope Dope. It's called Pretty World, and I've been very, of course, like so many of us, man. You know, just mentally anguished, depressed, unhappy, just about the way things are right now. The virus, violence, all of this stuff, and I was thinking. You know, that the world, we don't have any songs to make us really happy, you know. Back in the 60s, you know, when I was just a lot younger and a teenager, um, you know, there was the Vietnam War and there was Martin Luther King's assassination and Bobby Kennedy and JFK and Malcolm X and all the, the riots and the war in Vietnam. It was just not a great time. But you know what? We had great freaking music, man. We had the Beatles leading us along the way, man. We had, you know, Jimi Hendrix and... Sly and the Family Stone and all these wonderful bands and uh, singers, The Fifth Dimension, and uh, one of them was Sergio Mendes and Brazil 66, what I really loved. So one night I was on um, YouTube and I saw this video from Mas Que Nadas, which was Sergio's big hit in the 60s, and I loved it. I did like Lonnie Hall with amazing voice and young vibe and uh, Karen Phillips is wonderful but right below that there was another video called Pretty World and I said well I'm gonna listen to this one too and when I heard this song I said this is the song that we really need right now we need to get this song out there man it just lifts your spirits and gives you a smile and shows you the beauty of what we have if we want it even through these tough times so I went I called some amazing friends of mine Homero Lubambo on guitar and Pamela Driggs on vocals 
and a very underrated vocalist, and uh, Emily Bendiger on background vocals, and Stephen Wolf, the baddest drum programmer, and everybody was into it because I'm giving all of the proceeds away through uh, the Jazz Coalition, and uh, that's going to go directly to musicians. I don't see a dime. And the other thing is that uh, I went and I told Lewis about it and Fabian, and they got totally behind me, and I'm really happy. It's just a single, but singles and everything can light up the world. Anything can that makes you feel good. So I'm going to play for you now Pretty World to end this thing. And I hope you really like it. I love it. And, uh, you know, listen to it, stream it, share it. It's very important. The more money that comes in, the more we can give it to our fellow musicians and friends who are struggling right now. And thank you to Ropa Dope. And I'm really glad that I participated in this today. It's always good to be among a community of musicians. Take care. I gotta start it over again, man. I didn't have the keyboard on. I did not have the keyboard on. I thought I did, but I I don't. Well, here it is. That's why. Here's the keyboard on right over here. And this is the track right over here. Pretty sure. There we go. My sincere apologies. Here we go. Pretty world.
my time is up. I just want to remind everybody, here's my album, Black Magic. I hope you'll check it out. It's been a real pleasure. Always a pleasure to bring the music out there. And I thank everybody at Ropa Dope for including me in this. And you have a great day. And enjoy the rest of the music. There's some great artists doing this today, really. Take care. Welcome back, everybody. We are back live here uh, at the Rope It Up Room in East Philadelphia. We just heard some amazing performances by Sasha Masikowski, David Whitman, and Mr. Jason Miles with that musical biography. Uh, just some stunning, absolutely fantastic stories from, from Jason and his encounters with Mr. Miles Davis. Uh, Lewis, how are you making out today? I'm good. This is really stunning. I want to say thanks to all the musicians who are contributing this great music. And I'm really excited uh, about this live set coming up. Uh, Ali Hervonen and the, the Ali Hervonen Trio, I was gonna say, and band, but I've been told it's the trio, uh, brought to us from the great Andrew Neasley. And Ali has a great record out, check it out on Bandcamp. And without further ado, we'll take it straight to New York City.
Ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen the, the Ali Ali Trio. Uh, that's just a perfect example of how people get together, uh, musicians, and put their lives on the line, put themselves at risk in order to make the world a more beautiful place for us. Thank you, gentlemen. So, so very much appreciated. All right, guys, coming up next, we have some music from Max Bassesson and Malumbo. And then stay tuned after that because we have a special surprise coming from Mr. DJ Logic.
right. That Malumbo video takes me to places that I remember uh, before 2020. But right now we have uh, a very exciting, very exciting uh, story to tell, person to meet, and show to come. I've got a little echo. There we go. 21 years ago, 20 and a half years ago, uh, a gentleman came down from the Bronx to the lower New York, lower Manhattan jazz scene, which was popping at the time and popping in a way that was different than the previous iterations. It was kind of for the people. There were kids coming out, listening to jazz, Modesky Martin Wood, Knitting Factory, everything's happening. And this cat comes down with a couple of turntables. And quite honestly, he, I think he wanted to be a, a jazz soloist because I saw some of those shows back in the day and he was doing something completely different on the turntables than I had ever seen. I am talking about Mr. DJ Logic, and he's here with us tonight. Logic, how are you, man? Great, great. Happy to be here, happy to be a part of the festival. Happy to, you know, see all, well, I can't see everybody, but I'm happy all the listeners are here. And uh, yeah, you know. You asked me the other day, when did Rope It Up start? And yes. it starts with Project Logic, like that's it, right? You, yeah. Casey Benjamin. Yep, Casey Benjamin, Melvin Gibbs, Scooter Warner, Lamont McCain, Mike Whiteman, um, Scott Palmer, uh, Stefan Harris, yeah, Andy Hurwitz, Words. Uh, I might be leaving out some people. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Mark. Uh, who else? Uh, Mark Allen, I should say. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people that was all a part of, part of that. Modesky, Martin and Wood as well, Liz Penta and the whole crew. Um, yeah, it was you know special. Mark Rebo, you know, uh, Vernon Reed. It was a lot of people all a part of that. Being a part of my first record, and uh, it was something special. A big one, big family, you know, and uh, I still have that famous picture on the Brooklyn Bridge with everybody that came, you know, that was part that was a part of that record, and uh, it was special because it was like you said, the, you know, this Bronx kid coming downtown to the lo you know, um, to the village and the Lower East Side and all of that, and uh, taking in all of the experimental music as well as you know. You know, coming with you know, coming down from the Bronx, listening to hip hop and you know, reggae and Latin music, all the different genre music that I had coming from my borough, and coming down there, you know, bringing that, and just kind of mixing it all up and uh, being around all those wonderful musicians, you know, it kind of, you know, gelled and became became something organic for me and special. I really credit you for, for changing the way people hear the turntable. I mean, it was in hip hop and then it was sampled, you know, there'd be like a scratch here and there in some rock records or some funk records, right? Right, right. You're actually, you know, using the turntable as a full member of the band. Yes, yeah, and that's the thing I wanted to kind of stand out because, uh, you know, you had the sax player, you had the trumpet player, you had the keyboard player, and, uh, you know, and the drummer. Everybody had their, everybody played their part. And, um, you know, I just wanted to play my part just like they did. And, uh, you know, so I was just trying to find, you know, um, just classic jazz records and records that, you know, jazz records that I would listen to that I would get inspired from, from Miles Davis to John Coltrane, Weather Report, and um, the list goes on, and uh, you know all those things that I heard. I would just try to interpretate, and uh, you know also create the effect sounds and things like that, and also just listen. You know that was the most that was the big part, listening and learning how to improvise with those musicians and being able to uh, be as one. You know, and uh, you know as they would just pass the ball around. You know, I was just kind of wait for my turn to do my thing and then just do it well. 
Beautiful. I would be remiss if we didn't mention uh, Scott Harding. Yes, Scott Harding. I thought did I, did I say Scott? Yeah, Scotty. Scott Harding. I said Scott Palmer. That's right. Scott Scott Harding. My brother, I love him. He was, you know, he was the 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 chef and the you know magician in the in the studio. You know, he made the sound sound. He made he mixed the record. He made the record sound beautiful, and it was it was something special to work with him as well. Yeah. All right, man. It's so good to reconnect. Uh, you know, we've been chatting all these years, but it's nice to, to see you and be here doing something together. Same, uh, same here, Lewis. And thank you uh, so much. And you've been doing a great job watching Rope Dope. You know, starting off with Rope Dope and then seeing how Rope Dope has evolved with all the great artists. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to see all the great artists and hear all hear all the good music and which I got going on. And uh, you know, Rope Dope will always be family. And uh, you know, even during these terrible times, hopefully we go into you know the new the, the new year. Um, you know, something special, and we're all safe and healthy. And, and uh, you know, just looking forward to um, you know just seeing how things go. You know, beautiful. The next decade. Yeah. That's right. As dark as it is, there's still bright light. That's right. And. Uh, that's it, you know. Just keep revolving. Keep the keep rope up evolving. That's it. All right. Thanks to everybody. Uh, Mr. Fabian Brown, do we have anything? I'm I'm so excited to just be in the room and uh, just thanks to all you guys for listening. Support the artists on on Bandcamp and stay tuned because this next set is going to be amazing. DJ Logic. All right. All right. Well, I'm gonna be spinning. You know, this is kind of the start of of logic. You know, we'll be getting into tunes. You know, that from off my record. You know, a little discography. So uh, yeah, is um, listen, enjoy, and uh, yeah, take you on a little trip.
young man is very bright. Yes, so he's very ambitious. Afraid? No. Why would we be afraid?
in the skies. Yeah. So bye. Yeah. DJ Logic. My name's Subconscious. Can't nobody stop it. Check it. We setting it straight. The sonic flush the whole way. And radiate from the left to right side of face. When it passed through headphones, we heading home. Off of the dome, son. With that chrome, it's not. Licking shots and projectiles. But it's still tight. Wow, bear witness to the facts. Releasing secret energies out your cap. With my man DJ Logic on the scratch. <laughs> That's how he do on the ones or twos. And I'm bungeeing through on another groove. And anybody trying to step, they get shuffled through. Into a different understanding. Well, duck with you. And send you out of space. With a whole number energy, have you conversing with celestial entities coming through on this track, moving center people, hundred different styles to process mentally cool. <laughs> Trying to follow me, but I've been grinding through the grit like harmony. And y'all ain't heard my voice since the anomaly. But I've been working on mines and I stomp MCs on the daily. And this is how I get it done on that Bailey's and bond them up with that circus. I work this till I cause a short circuit and perch this earth on a brand new orbit. It's torturous. All off the smokest ball, kid. Got a whole lot of styles in this bag. Trying to keep up with mines will catch you jet lag. And the beats out the slab will send you back to Sam Ash. Shade of something or other, still undiscovered, but just like blubber, it gets converted into petroleum for uses by kids getting stupid with that disco fluid, breaking, six stepping, the sick weapons, flexing like Max Payne with lyrics to perfection, stick to foundation but moderate progression, be prevalent in every piece of wax that I'm pressing. Yeah. No question.
I'm wearing all throughout the afternoon. So what they do, they come and smoke some, you know, smoke some reeks in the afternoon. And then at night, they go and do whatever they have to do. You know, so they're taking that cheap wine and go and play some music. And the next morning, they back in the same game. Like Bob Vila on cable, step by step, I mesh words and collages. Through abstract vision, like rhythms by DJ Logic. Keep my talents focused towards positive causes, like freeing aviator monkeys with Matthew Warwick. Never cautious, run minds with no trial tests, keeping them constructive, like news clipping death threats and gets the blue ribbon in any contest. And yes, can use minimum effort to make your next hurt. Flex colossus, even all small excerpts. You don't always have to build brain scanners to school flocks of MCs with shootbox diagrammers. Now, listen up. But it's turned to fist the cuffs. I need apprentice who steps with first chemistry sets against my better rise grammar getting burnt like a rest. Subconscious sketch, atomic vision and phonic sound bombing you death. Manhattan project. What? DJ logic, y'all. It's the project. Yeah. It's the project, y'all. DJ logic, y'all. Colossal sound. When the underground's finest, rewind it. Get your mind in alignment. This is blending the two MCs. It's on consignment. It's the project, y'all.
think I lasted this long.
Sadly, my mom 
Now I can hear you. I'm sorry. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Memory Lane. Uh, Anomaly was the album that made me fall in love with rope So there were pieces of that in there. Hold up. Hold up. I can't hear you. Can you talk now? Yeah. You got me? Keep going. Keep going. I still can't. Uh, hello, hello. Talk hello. now? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Oh, hey, hold on. That's why. It might be a problem with my uh, mic right so now. I, st- I had to stop the music because I want to, you know, keep going. That's that's how much fun I was having. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay, how- now I can hear you perfectly. Good. You hear me? Yes, sir. Are we getting the same thing from HQ? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so uh, too. Yeah, man. Anomaly was the was the record that was probably my introduction to Robodo. 
So. Yeah, Anomaly, uh, DJ Logic Presents Project Logic, Xana Logic. I worked backwards. Oh, you worked backwards. Okay, okay, I got you. I got you. About Anomaly, like, I had, you know, in the 90s, I, I, I grew up in the uh, 60s and 70s, right? So I was not part of the hip-hop generation, right? It was right. Thing to me. It was different than the stuff that I listened to. Wait, what, what year you said? 60s and 70s? Yeah, I mean. Okay, hip hop came out in the seventies. You had to heard the Sugar Hill Gang. Commercially available, <laughs> available to a kid in New Jersey, not until seventy eight, seventy nine. Oh, okay, like I, I got you. I got you. All right. So, like, I grew up in the in the rock and roll generation, right? Oh, there you got Run DMC. Walk this way. <laughs> I'm gonna keep yeah, catching you. I was 20, 22 years old, right? I know. <laughs> but I watched in the I watched in the eighties and nineties people try to get to the heart of blending hip hop and jazz. It's not that I wasn't aware. It's just right. stuff that I grew up on, right? Right. Um, and I loved a lot of it. Digable Planets, you know. Falco Quest. Quest thing. Yeah, Gangstar. Right. You know. But yeah, I, this you know, goes I'm on. Yeah. Punk kid, so I liked I like Public Enemy and you know, yeah. like NWA, right? Yes. But when they ever they try to blend jazz and hip hop, it, it never felt I don't want to put it. It never felt dirty enough. Right. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Right. Until I heard Anomaly, it was like right. it's it's like right there in the groove. It captures the power. Right. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And also, I even appreciate the peers before me because, you, know, you know, I was influenced by a lot of jazz greats. I was influenced by a lot of great hip hop, you know, coming up and a lot of rock, a lot of fusion, um, you know, and a lot of uh, Latin, a lot of clips. I was influenced around a lot of stuff that I was hearing as a kid coming up. And then there was a lot of things that caught my ear, and I was just being an imaginative, imaginative kid, you know, in my head, thinking how I could blend these two, you know, these different sounds together and see how it come out. Even before sampling and all of that stuff, I just wanted to, you know, just collect the music and listen to the music and learn from the music, the rhythms, the beats, all that, you know, and uh then just kind of create my own my own sound just like everybody you know before me you know would do so thank you so much i appreciate you uh you know appreciate that you know i'm reminded of eddie palmieri actually at this project. yeah eddie palmieri that's right yeah, i love that i love that right yep yeah. yep tito puente too <laughs> You know, all that, that era, you know, Fania, All Stars, that seventies era. I loved loved all of that music. You know, that that was soulful. You know, it's just you like even ballrooms the... happening when you were a kid. Who said again? Like the ballrooms, like. Uh... Well, you know, that music, like I said, was playing around my neighborhood. Growing up in the Bronx, you know, it was. I had all type, you know, all cultures, you know, and. Uh, Everybody was free playing their their music and from their culture, and that's what made it so unique and so special in my neighborhood because it was colorful with all the different sounds and food and everything and how people were dressed and how people just expressed themselves and uh yeah and that that inspired me you know and um yeah, and then I just kind of put it all into my own little my own little form of what i what I was hearing and that stuck up, st stood up there, and just was able to, you know, present it in the right way, you know, to tell my story. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Logic. Thank you so much. Thank I hope you. That, uh, hope that we're doing this again in ten years. Or uh, so too. I want to. I love. To, I love to see. In ten years. Yeah, yeah. and uh, hopefully it won't be. Well, I don't know which way it'll be. Different this this type of way or. With some VR glasses or something virtual, I don't know. We're gonna have some type of way. We're gonna be able to interact. And uh, no, but uh, you know, I look forward to doing this again. And uh, I appreciate everyone listening. And uh, keep keep listening, keep listening, keep following Rope -a Dope, and uh, and check out all the great artists on Rope -a Dope as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. Follow DJ Logic. DJ Logic. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna set up. We're gonna set up. 
have a thing what, on what do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about my background? Dude, I'm just jealous. You know, I got to give it up to my wonderful engineer over here, Abby. She's holding it down, making me sound beautiful and look beautiful. Electric, Electric Garden. Garden. <laughs> Electric Garden Studios, they've been awesome to me. And, uh, yeah, it's been it's been great working out of here. And, uh, yeah, just wanted to give them a shout-out and some love. And thank you, Rope Dope and Lewis, for, happy, for having me. And we'll see you again soon. Love you. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, the end of day one of the Rope Dope Music and Arts Festival. Big shout out to, to Logic. We started the night with uh, the founder of Rope Dope Industries, and we ended the night with the first record, uh, the first artist on Rope Dope. And uh, it's been a beautiful trip backwards and trip forwards at the same time because people are still vibrant and going. Tomorrow, we've got music coming up. Uh, from a variety of robot up artists uh, coming out of Mexico City, Cienfuegos. Uh, we have some, uh, we have a set from Jonathan Scales uh, up in New York, and we have a set from Johanna Bernhardt in London. And then we're going to have a little happy hour at five o'clock. Uh, a bunch of robot up artists hanging out. We welcome you to join the stream, ask your questions. Check everybody out as they discuss uh, being a musician in 2020 in this fascinating age. And then we're going to close the night out tomorrow with uh, an interview that I did with Christian Scott Atunde Ajwa uh, about his final, final for the year, performance uh, at Blue Note just as COVID was hitting uh, with, his, uh, with his incredible band uh, interspliced with some of the tracks from that. So come back and join us tomorrow. Shout out to Launch Global. Really appreciate this. Uh, and we'll see you tomorrow. fundamentally an emotional connection. Doesn't matter where you're from in the world, what language you speak, music, we all speak that same language. I believe that music gives us an opportunity to tap into something greater and, and to connect people. The music industry is kind of like a giant vacuum now and I think in order for art to thrive you need a community. Work at something and then hopefully meet the right person that can make it a little easier on you to, to, to make things happen. Like an organization like Launch which is finding these people, not only the musicians and the artists but the people working on the back end of things who are also musicians and artists themselves so they understand sort of the struggles we have to get together to help other artists because that's what every artist and musician needs. They need a team. You hear it everyone like unanimously.